three of the four editors of this widely acclaimed book about Pakistan and the ongoing situation. The title of the book is Faith-Based Violence and Diobandi Militancy in Pakistan. So I'm sitting down with three of the four editors. Um, I guess I want to begin with, um, you know, if all three of you could comment on what motivated this project and what really inspired you to, to put out this important text about Pakistan and the ongoing situation there. Thank you, Caleb, for having us uh, with my colleagues, Edwina Pio, Tahir Kamran, Abbas Zaidi, uh, and myself, all four of us. In 2015, we sat together and we identified that we were not happy and satisfied with the current discourse on terrorism. We identified that in the mainstream media, as well as academic scholarship, there was a gap. <clears throat> there were sweeping and generalizing statements uh, which were, in fact, uh, blurring the picture of terrorism and militancy, which is currently emanating from the world of Islam. We were able to identify uh, something which we thought that terrorism is not. And that misidentification is rooted in our perspective, and that is something which we have tried to offer uh, through this book. In four or five false binaries, and those binaries are that number one, terrorism is an issue which is Islam versus West. So, to, so create a dichotomy that it is Islam versus West, which is the uh, main cause, a root cause of terrorism. So that is first false binary. The second false binary which we identified was that it is Muslim versus Christians, or Muslim versus Jews, or Muslim versus Hindus, so Muslim versus non-Muslim. So that binary is often uh, produced and recycled in mainstream media. We also wanted to depart from this false binary. We do not agree with this binary. The third binary was uh, the Sunni versus Shia binary. That terrorism is happening in the world because Sunnis and Shias, they are fighting with each other. And we had a problem with this binary because the majority of victims of terrorism worldwide, right from Pakistan to Africa to Iraq to, to Middle East and other countries, the majority of victims, they happen to be Sunni Muslims. Hmm. So in, indeed, that is not really a Sunni versus Shia. Sure, binary. that doesn't fit the narrative. That, that doesn't fit the narrative. And the, another false binary which we identified was that terrorism is a reaction of the have-nots against the haves. That those uh, who, ha who are more developed are those who are more prosperous. They are facing uh, terrorism at the hands of those who are the have-nots. And indeed, there are many examples right from 9-11 hijackers who were very well off. Nine, nine out of 11 were Saudi citizens. And indeed, they were not amongst the have-nots. And there are many other examples. In Pakistan, we even have some incidents where people uh, from middle class or upper middle class family, uh, educated from some of the top ranking institutions, they have been involved in acts of terrorism. So that is something. So these were the binaries which we wanted to confront. Front, and we thought that it is extremely important to identify the ideological roots of terrorism. Mm -hmm. So it was important to isolate uh, extremist ideology and the ex extremist sections from mainstream Muslims. And when, I, and when we use this word mainstream Muslims, we would like to isolate terrorists uh, who emanate from but do not represent the majority of who emanate from uh, Devbandi tradition within Pakistan, but on a global scale, they emanate from Wahhabi and Salafi tradition. That's not to say that the majority of Devbandis or Salafis or Wahhabis, they happen to be extremists, no. They, they happen to be as moderate Muslims or as moderate human beings as anyone else. But unfortunately, almost all of the terrorists in the world today, including in Pakistan, they happen to be either from the Bandi, Salafi, or Wahhabi tradition. And this, that's where we thought that it is extremely important that we have to identify and then we have to engage with this group. Well, thank you very much for that explanation. 
Now, um, I, I wanted to, to move on to Tahrir. Uh, you were saying, I, I know we hear this term radical Islam constantly in the media. We say the problem is radical Islam, that people say there's something separate about the Islamic faith, or they demand that Muslims denounce terrorism. Um, and we also hear this point about a clash of civilizations. We hear that it's said that, you know, that the way we live in the West is just so different than the way people live in other parts of the world. But I seem, it seems that you've pointed out that what, what seems to be the issue is not so much a clash of civilizations, but rather a clash within civilizations. Can you explain this point? Yes, well, um, uh, when I was uh, working on this uh, Shia Sunni uh, piece or uh, chapter of this book, um, what I found out um, through, the, through the texts that various uh, Deobandi scholars have produced, that uh, the, the rhetoric against the Shias uh, was quite pronounced, uh, which remained blurred and which remained uh, a bit you know, uh, which remained hidden till the British were ruling subcontinent. But uh, after 1949, you know, that year I, I, I consider very important so far as the Pakist Pakistani history is concerned because the Obandis started coming to the, to the political forefront um, from 1949 onwards. They regrouped because they were in opposition to the creation of Pakistan, but when Pakistan uh, was created, they uh, regrouped, they re redefined their, their ideology somewhat, um, and uh, then uh, they started uh, a campaign against Ahmadis and afterwards Shias. So it was a particular group that was uh, peddling the, the, that ideology against the Shia minority, which was quite influential in some areas of Pakistan. Uh, so, uh, so, so when I uh, looked at the global scale um, uh, through uh, Saudi Arabia, that uh, that ideology was uh, casting a profound influence, uh, you know, and uh, um, like, you know, uh, the p particular version of Quran was distributed in Tajikistan in 1989, uh, you know, and that uh, particular version of Quran uh, was produced by Saudi Arabia, and that was essentially anti-Shia. Uh, so, uh, so th that phenomenon that I, I, I consider as clash within the civilization, and that's the biggest challenge. It's not uh, Islam versus West, but but what Muslims have to address first of all is these are the, these are some of the groups and factions which are uh, w which are berating other factions and declaring them or denouncing them as as uh, anti-Muslims or non-Muslims and Shias are and Shias are very very important component of uh, of Islam uh, of Islam and Muslims at large because if you you see from Tajikistan and up to Bahrain you know there are a number of uh, countries having sizable Shia presence, like you know, Bahrain itself has 70 percent of Shias, and that country is ruled by by Sunni, uh, and uh, you know, coercive means are employed uh, to to sustain that rule. Similarly, Kuwait and Iran and Iraq, of course. Uh, so uh, rather 15 to 20 percent Shias, they live in Saudi Arabia and uh, wherever they live, that's the main source of uh, oil generation. So, so there is a dichotomy, sectarian dichotomy within Saudi Arabia. So, uh, so, so these are the economic interests, these are uh, some of the vested interests of small groups which uh, have quite a, quite a bit of influence, which is um, uh, generating this false perception among the Muslims that, well, uh, Shias and Sunnis are inveterate enemies of each other. Uh, the, uh, well, and uh, I have discussed and I have uh, said quite the otherwise, and I argue quite the otherwise, that, well, these are the two different factions having slight uh, differences or discrepant interpretations of the foundation text, but they're, uh, they're one and the same. Okay. Yeah, so. now, Edwina, you in particular have talked about religious minorities, um, uh, in particular the Christians, and that their, their role in this conflict and how they've been treated. Uh, would you like to explain that to our audience? Yes, yeah, sure. I think I got involved in this uh, book as the second co-editor, primarily because I believe in a diversity narrative that I think is very important in any organization, in any country, because it helps to avoid the miniaturization of human beings. And therefore, for example, uh, I could, for example, be a mother, I could be a Muslim or a Christian, I could be a scholar, I could be a person of color, 
Um, and I could also be someone who might be persecuted by a majority group. But when we say majority group, we need to be very clear that in this particular book, we are highlighting the fact that it is a particular sect. In this example, it's Deobandi militancy in Pakistan. And as my colleague Jawad mentioned, uh, it's not all Deobandis, it's a particular group within there. Now, also my reason for getting involved in this particular project was the fact that all Christians in Pakistan do not come from the lower socioeconomic status though the majority do come. They were converted from Hindus and they were the lowest caste system mm. among Hindus. Unfortunately, not much of that has changed. However, there were also a number of Christians who migrated from the then Portuguese um, controlled Goa in India to Pakistan. And many of them achieved very high status in the Pakistan government, in the military, uh, composing the national anthem as Olympic sports players in Pakistan. Somehow that gets erased. Hmm. And uh, when we talk of Christians in Pakistan, it's also important to remember that they don't feel safe because of blasphemy laws. Uh, and blasphemy laws could be put into effect because one wants the property of a particular place. Hmm. One wants certain members of the family of a particular place. It could be a woman, for example. And uh, there's very little to prevent them, that's the Christians, from really saying, uh, we want to live in peace, we want to live in harmony. We've coexisted with Muslims for centuries and there hasn't been a problem. So it's the overall mac macrocosm looking at Muslims as a broad brush canvas rather than saying it's specific people who are doing this particular uh, terrorism and atrocities. Mm. Now before we conclude, I would like all three of you to comment because it seems like one of the underlying issues in American politics right now is our relationship with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Donald Trump was highly critical of Saudi Arabia during his campaign. He called out Hillary Clinton for the fact that she had received Saudi support for her foundation. He talked against them. But then we see him recently going on his trip to Saudi Arabia, dancing with the Saudi king. Um, and we've heard a lot of talk about Saudi Arabia's role in spreading the Wahhabi ideology and the Wahhabi perspective. Um, and I would like the three of you to touch on Saudi Arabia's role and, and Saudi Arabia's role in Pakistan and in what, what's being described as this clash within civilizations. Could, could the three of you do that? Would that be all right? Yeah. Oh, great. Well, well, I'm uh, personally uh, quite critical of uh, of Saudi Arabia's role in Pakistan, and particularly the the version uh, and the, the discourse, particularly prevalent among the upper echelons of uh, of uh, American politics and government, because uh, Saudi Arabia um, is peddling. Uh, a peculiar version of Islam, uh, which is a minority version, and which is a historical version, um, and which is very, very scriptural in its uh, its essence. Uh, so, uh, just because of the the oil money, um, uh, various uh, religious seminaries or madrasas are being being set up, and uh, in the name of countering uh, influence. Uh, Shia influence from Iran, uh, it, it has been meddling into the affairs of Pakistan. Uh, and uh, since it, uh, it has vast resources, oil and mineral resources, so whole of the world listens uh, to, to Saudi Arabia, including uh, President Donald Trump. Indeed, we are running short on time, but I, if the other two of you would like to yes. comment just quickly on Saudi Arabia, and then we will conclude. Uh, yes. so. I think I'd just like to mention the fact that if we say, as my colleague Tahir mentioned, that Saudi Arabia can have such a major influence, it could also have a major influence on gender. And gender becomes a very critical aspect when one looks at the fact that many people feel that Muslims subjugate their women totally. So they could also be a very powerful influence in saying that Islam does not really say that women need to be subjugated. Mm -hmm. Women have freedom, women could start their own business, they could choose to decide what they want to wear and what they want to do and how they perform Islam. Mm -hmm. I think over the last few years, uh, a few decades, uh, at least some sections within Saudi government and establishment, they have also to some extent realized that there has to be some control over uh, extremist Wahhabism. 
Saudi Arabia uh, and some of its own uh, government uh, ministers and princes, they have uh, been victim uh, of terrorism. Uh, and recently we have seen, only yesterday, that there was a failed attack on uh, the main uh, mosque, Masjid al-Haram in Mecca. So indeed, uh, this extremist Wahhabism or extremist Devbandiism or Takfirism, it is sparing no one. And uh, Saudi government and establishment, they also have to be uh, more aware of this. They should be engaged in a constructive manner. Iran should be engaged. All other countries, they have to be engaged that, that these extremists, uh, they do not represent any community, they do not represent any religion, but that doesn't mean they do not follow, they do not follow an ideology. That ideology and the extremist streaks within that ideology, they have to be identified, they have to be engaged, they have to be educated, and sometimes legal and punitive action also have to be taken. And, and, and Iran should be taken on board. You know, that, that, that will be a huge step forward in the right direction. Well, I, I do thank you all for making these points. And I feel like if Americans are going to understand, as they increasingly become afraid of terrorist attacks, if they're going to understand the threat that they're facing, they really need to come to understand the issues that you describe here in this text. So I really do thank you all for the opportunity to sit down. Uh, the book is called Faith-Based Violence and Diobandi Militancy in Pakistan. I know I'm going to be getting a copy before I go. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.